Today's speaker is part of the Cross Cultural Center um, speaker series that was started a few years back in the hope that we would bring world class speakers to, here, to be here at Pasadena City College. In the years past, we brought Benjamin Bratt, Lalo Alcaraz, Alicia Gaspar de Alba, Rigoberto Menchu, Sherman Alexi, and Cornell West. Last summer alone, we had Sandra Singh Lowe and Gish Jen, both authors. So we're very pleased to be able to, to host uh, Jonathan Kozel here today. This, it's what's important for you to hear though, is that all these speakers came because of you guys. They came here to speak to students and they also came because you paid for them. And how did you pay for them? All, this, all of the funds came from something called the Student Service Fund. Every time you buy a soda out of a vending machine, every time you get something at the cafeteria, every time you buy those books from the bookstore, we have arranged to get a percentage back that comes back and is put in a, in a grant fund specifically to serve students that can't go to overhead administrative costs, they can't go to buy new buildings, it has to go directly to serve you as students. And what does that mean for you guys? It means that we get to have speakers like this, it means that we get to take field trips and buses and vans instead of making you drive. It means that our children at the child daycare center here on campus can have nutritional snacks. Um, if any of you have done commencement or have had fans, fan, friendly, family and friends go through commencement, your student service fund grant pays for that. So I encourage all of you, I know um, there are other alternatives for you to buy your books, but I really do encourage you to think about buying some of your books through the bookstore because that dollar does come back to serve you as students here on campus. Um, I'd like to give some thanks today because this event does not happen in a vacuum. We are very lucky and very blessed to be on a campus that values diversity, values opinions, and values speakers such as Mr. Kozel today. Um, first of all, I need to thank the wonderful women of the Office of Student Affairs, Rebecca Cobb, who you see walking around back there. Um, they've always, always, always. When you look to have a posse who has your back, it's always them. So they're always there. I'd like to thank the bookstore staff right over there and Leslie for helping arrange to have uh, Mr. Kozel's books here today. And again, uh, this doesn't happen in a vacuum and, and things like this cost a lot of money and it's very important to recognize those who make the sacrifices to, to find room in their budget to bring speakers. And Dr. Jacqueline Jacobs, Vice President for Academic Affairs, very generous. And also the support from uh, Vice President L Dr. Lisa Sugimoto, who is the Vice President of Student and Learning <laughs> Services, uh, also a key person in helping bring Dr. Kozel on, so thank you as well. There are many uh, friends and professors who are out here who help support, your, support me in this work, so I thank them personally. Your professors do a wonderful job, and please be sure to thank them. And also, the last but not least, certainly to you as students, because we do this because of you. If you were not here, this college would not exist. And I don't ever forget that. You as students are here to have a, a learning opportunity and it's my job to provide you with the best world class quality that I can. So I want to thank you for being here and always remember that you guys are the reason why we're here as a college. So give yourselves a big hand. And I really hope that these types of speakers will encourage and inspire you to be active citizens, active in your local schools, and to be critical thinkers who ask the hard questions. Now, for the introduction. As a young man, during the, during the Freedom Summer of 1964, Jonathan Kozel was moved by the, mur the murders of three young civil rights workers. He changed his plans to enter graduate school and drove to the center of Boston's black community and volunteered to teach reading in the summer freedom schools there. The experience, this experience set into motion a passion and a dedication to the most vulnerable, our nation, to this, to our nation's most vulnerable, our children. Over the years, he has written several books forcing America to confront the way in which we, the richest nation in the world, treat our children. From his experiences as inner city Boston school teacher came Death at an Early Age, a 1968 National Book Award winner in science, philosophy, and religion. Read by educators across America, it has sold more than two million copies. He has written about the lives of the homeless, the struggle of children living in the most abhorrent conditions, and the struggle of which and the struggle and grace in which these families cope. Yet to me and many faculty members who I spoke today, um, one of his books is the most inspiring. It's called Savage Inequalities. And this is the book that probably had the biggest impact on me. And when I heard he was free to come and speak, that inspired me to come. Because if you, once you understand the savage inequalities between those who have and those who have not, it's hard to look away. 
Now his latest book, The Shame of a Nation, The Restoration of Apartheid Schooling in America, Kozel, as only he can, examines the widening gulf between those who have and those who have not, and, the, and details the unfulfilled promise of desegregation. And now, friends, I am proud to introduce to you Jonathan Kozel. Thanks, Carrie, very much. Can you all hear me? Fine, good. Those of you who are standing in the back, you know, you can sit right, you can sit right up here, comfortable in the front. You can sit on the floor. I won't give you a test or something. <laughs> you look frightened. Sit up here. You'll be more comfortable. Um, there seem to be a great many wires in, in, in this universe today. All right. You still hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, thanks to Superintendent Percy Clark for, for joining us. Thanks for being here. I hope I'll see you a few weeks at the Council of Great City Schools. Um, thanks to Dr. Jacobs and um, everyone from PCC who, who made this visit possible, especially the nice folks I got to spend time with last night. And I, I owe special thanks to um, Carrie for welcoming me to Pasadena last night with a giant box of sugar frosted flakes, <laughs> which is my secret medicine against physical exhaustion, high stakes tests, and all the other forces of wickedness and evil in the world. So thank you. Um, are there any teachers here or people who want to be teachers or people who teach teachers? Ah, good. Well, I'm very glad because I feel very close to teachers in the public schools, um, especially the ones who work with little kids in elementary school, in the younger grades, which is what I used to do. I, uh, I think they do the best thing that there is to do on earth, bring joy and beauty and mystery and mischief to the hearts of little pint-sized people. And um, I hope a lot of you who are just now beginning to think what you're going to do with your careers will look to the classroom, the public school classroom, um, especially those younger grades, um, as a beautiful way to, um, to dedicate your life to, to decency and, and beauty and democracy. I think it's a wonderful profession. Anyway, I visit schools all the time because I like to be with teachers. I wish I had time to visit one here in Pasadena. Um, <clears throat> but I visited many schools in Los Angeles, for example. When I come out here, typically I get trapped in the principal's office. and. That, and I don't mind that, you know, because many of the principals are old friends of mine, but still, it's not much fun to visit a school and sit in the principal's office. Like, that's where I used to be sent to be punished. <laughs> and it's bad when I was a kid. So I'm always glad when some teacher rescues me. Like a teacher who knows me, well, first grade teacher will come in and grab me by the arm and say, come on, and visit my class. And she drags me out of the principal's office, down the corridor, brings me into her class. And then, of course, she puts me on the spot and says, OK, teach something. You, know, <laughs> you write books about it. Let's see if you can still do it. And typically, I always ask the wrong kind of question, because um, I forget. And I ask the kind of question that gets all the kids jumping out of their chairs. You know, and every one of these kids is waving their hands. And as all teachers know, and as some of you probably remember from elementary school, children have only a theoretical, little ones, like seven-year-olds, they have only a theoretical connection to their chair. You know, <laughs> They basically defy the force of gravity. And I never understand why they don't just collapse but through the floor down to the classroom underneath them. But anyway, they're all waving their hands at me. And typically, there's one like right in the front row who's waving her hand wildly right in my face, right in front of me. So I 
her fingers are going to poke my eyes out. And she, and, and she starts st making these terrible sounds. Ooh, ooh, you know, ooh, I know, I know, ooh. And as if you don't call on her, she'll die. And then I, so I call on her, and she looks up at me with this sweet little face, and she says, what? <laughs> she just wanted me to call on her, you know, that's all. And just wanted me to, to notice her, her little self. It's a humbling experience for an old teacher to go back and, and do that sort of thing. But I think it's important to do it, to keep going back, to remember what it's like. I sometimes think that every arrogant politician in our nation's capital who talks so condescendingly about the alleged failings of our classroom teachers in America, and they do that all the time, they're very patronizing about teachers. I sometimes think that every one of those, of those arrogant politicians ought to be obliged to come into an inner city classroom one day every year and actually teach a class and find out what it's like. It's all too easy to forget. The president says that testing is the answer to our nation's problems. Um, and many urban schools, as a result, some principals are, principals are so scared now of these tests that they're starting high-stakes tests in kindergarten. Now, I doubt that happens in this district because I suspect you have an enlightened superintendent who, but who would see the, you know, the absurdity of this, but in many districts, they're actually starting high-stakes bubble tests. You know what they are? Bubble tests? How many know what I mean? Yeah, but some of you don't know what I mean. You know, like, where you have to fill out an answer form, we have to use your number two pencil to fill in one of those little things. And oh, I, 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 can't, I hated tests. The, the, the darn number two pencils, you know, the point would always break. And the eraser would smudge it. We do think we can, you know, we can send people to the moon, but we can't figure out how to manufacture a number two pencil that won't break. Anyway, um, the, the, uh, so in some districts, they're doing this to kids in kindergarten. And there's one district, which I quote in my new book, The Shame of the Nation. The book is full of just, it's narrative. It's not, it's not a lot of uh, educational sort of jargon and gobbledygook. So you know, that's, I, that's why it's on the bestseller list, because people actually enjoy reading it. No, nobody likes reading this. Um, that ed lang, educational language, frankly, is very dull, and it's awful to have to read it. I read it because I read like the state standards. I'm probably one of the few masochists in America who actually read this stuff. And these school improvement plans, do any of you know what that is? You know, I read all that stuff. And um, it's just horrible. I mean, I, and I re I've read the standards for for um, Washington State, New York State, Texas, Massachusetts, and California, all the literacy standards. And I defy anybody in this room, if you ever read that stuff, it, like, it's full of these like, big words where little words would do perfectly well. You know, take a good old-fashioned solid Anglo-Saxon noun like skill. Call it a proficiency. And the standards writers just melt into a pool of satisfaction that you're willing to be as pretentious as they are. Um, you know, they, they, they never say, we're going to copy a good idea. No, replicate. <laughs> you know, you, you can't, you can't um, start something. No, initiate. You can't do it even. No, implement. <laughs> so it's always bogus big words where little words would do. I was lucky in college. I studied writing with a great poet, Archibald MacLeish, who spent, do any of you remember him? A few do, yeah. Um, who like spent two years getting rid of all the polysyllables in my vocabulary so that I could write real English that people would enjoy. Anyway, um, so in some of these schools where they're giving high stakes tests in kindergarten, the principals have been forced, in order to have extra time to drill the kids, 
to do test prep for these tests. These little kindergarten kids, you know. They've canceled recess and nap time. Nap time, they've denied them nap time. These are kids who need their nap more than the stupid test. And they need recess more than the test, frankly. I mean, I, what's, that, what's happening to our country? Who, who is seriously suggesting that we give these kind of tests to little babies? Um, anyway, these little kids pee in their pants. The teacher can't help them. They don't know that pages go from left to right even. If at least we gave these, the poorest kids in our country really good preschool education, then they'd have some chance to pass these tests. But typically, overwhelming number of poor kids, especially poor children of color, black, Latino, get virtually no preschool education in America before they come to public school. Um, the, the percentage of children in America who get Head Start, of eligible children, according to Marion Wright Edelman, who's the head of the Children's Defense Fund, with whom I just met in Washington two weeks ago, percentage of children who get Head Start um, it has just dropped to below 50 percent. Uh, that's due to the budget priorities of the past, the past uh, since, since 2000, past five years. Uh, and many school districts I visit, pre the best way to find out is to ask the kindergarten teacher, how many of your kids had preschool? That's the way to find out. Typically, kindergarten teachers in the inner cities will say, maybe a quarter of these kids got something for half a year, at most, okay? Typically, they'll say most of them got nothing. Meanwhile, the children, wealthy people, very wealthy people in America, typically get two three or three and a half years of rich developmental preschool before they even come to public school. Uh, in New York, the best preschools <coughs> for, the, for the rich are, are, are now um, costing about $22,000 a year. Can you imagine that? And uh, the best ones in New York are so competitive that they have interviews to get in. They interview two and a half year olds. And, and it, they're very competitive. You want your kid to get into the best pre-K, you, you have to hire, there's a new profession in New York now called a preschool interview coach. It costs $500 an hour, according to the New York Times. So it must be true. It's in the New York Times. Five, for $500 an hour, you can hire somebody to coach your two-year-old and how to really hit that interview. Um, and meanwhile, the kids I know get nothing. It is, I'd like to say to you, outrageous, just outrageous, to impose so many high-stakes tests on children in the earliest grades of school if we had first denied them any opportunity for preschool. Uh, there's something deeply hypocritical in a society that holds a child seven or eight years old accountable, that's the buzzword nowadays, right? Holds that little baby seven or eight years old accountable for her performance on a standardized exam but does not hold the president and the members of the Congress accountable for robbing her of what they gave their own kids six years earlier. It's unacceptable, unacceptable. Um, my friends, in terms of Elemental racial justice in the public schools, we stand today at one of the most dangerous and reactionary moments in our nation's history. Segregation, racial segregation of black and Latino kids has returned to public schools with a vengeance. Uh, I've just spent five years visiting 60 public schools from coast to coast, 11 different states, if you took a photo of the typical classroom that I visit in any inner city school from New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Chicago, Seattle, or Los Angeles, you would, and, you look, and it's a color photo, you would think you were looking at a photograph uh, from an old textbook of a classroom in Mississippi 50 years ago. There, I never see white children. Um, the proportion of black kids 
who now attend segregated schools is at its highest level since 1968. Uh, the foremost segregated states for black and Latino kids in America are number one, New York, number two, Michigan, number three, Illinois, number four, California. Uh, I walk into these schools, these hyper-segregated schools. I look around me at the faces of the children. If I have the nerve, I look into their eyes. And I often see them looking into mine because little children search the eyes of grown-ups all the time. And I try to tell myself that this postmodern and millennial apartheid is what Martin Luther King and all our other martyrs died for. Most Americans still pay lip service to Dr. King, but we have ripped apart his legacy. Now, I get attacked a lot by right-wing critics. You know, like some of the charming people you see on Fox TV. Uh, and, uh, I have to tell you, uh, a very close friend of mine, a writer named Susan Eaton, uh, just called me on my cell and told me that she was at the Red Sox game in Boston. I'm from Boston the other night. And uh, she said, uh, this is a woman who really fights for poor people in this country. And <clears throat> she said, guess who was in the row in front of me? It was Bill O'Reilly. And she said, I had a big, big, you know, thing of beer in my hand. <laughs> she didn't tell me what she did with it. <laughs> um, some of these guys are really mean, I'm telling you. And they, they are really, some of these types are, off, are awfully vicious. But I mean these right-wing types, these charming people from places like the Heritage Foundation. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, and interesting, how many of you have ever heard of the Heritage Foundation? No? Of you have. Okay, this bunch, of, it's like a it's, it's a, it's a big building full of nasty people. <laughs> I don't know where they come from. I think they recruit them at Dartmouth College, and then they ship them to the Heritage Foundation in order to poison the clean air of our good country. But um, for some reason, a lot of these people like me. I don't know why, because I don't like them. But... <laughs> Some of them like me and they try to be compassionate to me when we debate. And they'll say, well, Jonathan seems like a nice guy. Um, he seems to care about Latino and black children. The only trouble is he doesn't give enough statistics. They always say that. Because I don't, I don't like to bore people to death. They say he doesn't give enough hard data. That's another phrase they love, data. They say he only writes about the things he knows. So, which is true, of course. That's a problem most of them don't have, by the way. Uh, but, um, but, um, but anyway, so I said, okay, this time, oh, hi, I'm glad you're all sitting here. This is like pre-kindergarten where everybody's on the reading rug. Very good. Um, I love it. Um, anyway, they always say he doesn't give enough statistics. So this time I said, okay, I'm going to fool them. I mean, get me some statistics. And I did. And if you're interested in the segregation rate in the neighborhood I happen to be writing about most of the time, which is the South Bronx in New York, here, here are the numbers. Um, in this little neighborhood which my last three books have taken place, although the Shame of the Nation is, is a national book. The new book has a lot about Los Angeles, but the little neighborhood where I've written most of my books for the past 15 years, there are 11,000 children in the elementary schools there, okay? 11,000 children in this neighborhood. Of those 11,000 children, guess how many are white? 26. 26. Now, this poses, of course, a, a big arithmetic problem. 
and I'm not too good in arithmetic because I went to a progressive school. Um, but I can do long division. That's a segregation rate of 99.8%. Now, two-tenths of one percentage point now mark the difference between legally enforced apartheid in the South of 50 years ago and socially and economically arranged apartheid in most of our major cities now. And you would find exactly the same stats or worse if you went to any big high school or elementary school right here in Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> ultimate irony, if you want to see a really segregated school anywhere in America, you know how to find it? Ask for a school that's named for Dr. Martin Luther King. It's a joke among black people. Chris Rock makes a joke, a very similar joke, about Martin Luther King Boulevard being always the most dangerous street in town. Um, I find if I, want to, if I want to locate a really segregated school, I just ask for one that's named for Dr. King or else Rosa Parks, uh, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, old friends of mine, both of them, uh, or Thurgood Marshall, ultimate irony. In New York, there's a school named in honor of Jackie Robinson. They wanted to honor him. <clears throat> Any of you know who he was? Yeah. Man who brought into racial integration to Major League Baseball. So how do you honor the man who integrated baseball? In New York, they do it by giving him, naming for him, a school for him that's 97% black and Latino, 1% white and 2% other. And I never say who other is, but I don't like that word other anyway. It's very it's anonymous. It sounds like it could be striped people or something, <laughs> or leopards or something. But um, no, a few, of the, a few of these schools are good schools. But, and if there's one here in Pasadena with a name for Dr. King, I'll assume that's one of the exceptions, just to be polite. But... Um, Typically, these are not good schools. Typically, the schools that are named for these in heroes of integration, these freedom fighters, these people who have given their lives to end apartheid in America, these schools are bastions of apartheid. They are usually the most poorly funded schools in America, the most overcrowded schools, the dirtiest schools, the most smelly, with the most smelly basement cafeterias. Oh, I hate those places. Kids always take me down to see where they eat. The principals never, never suggest you go to, to see the cafeteria, but the kids say, come down and see lunchroom hell. Um, they're always the schools like that. They're always the vile places with the lowest uh, performance, lowest graduation rates, and in which also in just most unpleasant places where children have the least delight in their childhood because the tension and anxiety in these buildings. I always wonder, why do we name, welcome, come right in, you came just in time. I always wonder, why do we name these horrible schools for people that black folks love? Why not name these schools for people they don't like? <laughs> like, name the, you know, like, William Bennett School of Personal Morality. Uh, <laughs> Clarence, Tom, Clarence Thomas Academy of Self-Hate and Self-Help, or something like that. George Bush Academy of Garbled Syntax, you know, but, don't, but sa save the name of Dr. King for a school that lives up to his dream. It's my own belief. Virtually all these segregated schools are savagely unequal. Simple example across the nation on average, including California, probably worse in California, but on average, from coast to coast, uh, a, an overwhelmingly black Latino school with about 1,000 kids receives $1 million less per year in funding than an overwhelmingly white school of the same size. A per pupil difference of about $1,000 each per year. My arithmetic rate, I hope it's right, 
1,000 kids times $1,000 each. Is that a million? See, don't go to progressive school. I still have trouble. Um, I mean, isn't that amazing? One one, and you know, there are people who say, oh, does money really matter? Yeah, you know who asked that question. It's always the ones who go to the most expensive schools who ask that. George Bush asks that question. Now, he went to a school called Andover. Have you ever heard of that? I happen to live 15 minutes from Andover. I, I live in Massachusetts. And schools like Andover and Exeter um, now cost about um, $35,000 a year. What do you spend per pupil a year? About 7000 or something? Yeah. And it's always the people who go to those schools who say, can you really buy your way to a better education for poor children? They always do that. They, they're, they're, sometimes they have two, two kids at schools like that. They're wealthy people I know. So they're, sending, they're spending $70,000 a year to make sure that their two kids are on the royal road to Harvard or Princeton or, if they're so unlucky, Yale. And, um, and, and, um, and so they're spending all that money for their kids. And when I write about black and Latino kids in LA or New York, they look at me and say, can you really buy your way to better education for those children? Pure hypocrisy. You'll hear it from your governor and other important people here in California. And I always say, you know, they say to me, can you really buy a better education for poor kids? And they're spending all that money for their kids? And they typically ask it over dinner around dessert time, you know, when the creme brulee is being served. <laughs> and and they say, you know, just tell me one thing, Jonathan, can you really buy your way to better education in the public schools? And, uh, you know, I'm a very polite person, but sometimes if I've had a couple of glasses of wine, I look him right in the eyes and I'll say, I don't know, it seems to do the trick for your kids, doesn't it? <laughs> Let's be blunt about this, you know. There's pure hypocrisy. Anyway, little ones I write about in the South Bronx now get about 11000 per year put into their education. That's higher than California, but... Uh, the cost of living in New York is, spe is, so, is so high, that's like 7,000 anywhere else. Anyway, 11,000. Now, some of you have read my last two books and have met Pineapple. Anyone here remember Pineapple, the plump little girl I described in um, my last book? She's been on TV a lot because she got um, a lot of uh, TV people like Rosie O'Donnell got to like Pineapple very much. She was this plump little girl who bossed me around all the time. Very bossy little girl. And she did that, did that with grown-ups, and most grown-ups didn't mind because she did it so well. You know, she, like, she was so skillful at manipulating you. You just, be, you just want to congratulate her on you know, how well she could <laughs> make you do whatever she wanted. And uh, Mrs. Clinton came up to the neighborhood once, and. Uh, there is a reporter following around named Robert Novak. Do you know who that is? Yeah. Uh, that man scares me. Every time I see him, I have a bad dream. But <laughs> this is a mean looking. But um, he was in the picture. He was following her around. They were trying to get a photo of Mrs. Clinton. Pineapple's very bossy. She sees them and she points to him. She says, You, get out of the picture. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, Anyway, there's a little pineapple whom any of you would love if you knew her. And we're spending $11,000 a year on her. You lift her up in your grown-up arms, in your kind arms, and you plunk her down in any typical suburb. Just outside New York, she'd be getting $12,000, $15,000 put into her public education every year. You lift her up again, and you plunk her down in one of the really wealthy suburbs, you know, where the doctors and the lawyers and the business leaders live. Uh, and she'd be getting $22,000 put into her public education every single year. So, you know, we say in church or synagogue that all our children are of equal value in the eyes of God. And in the eyes of God, my friends, I'm sure they are, but not in the eyes of America. In the eyes of America, 
because of the unjust, undemocratic way in which we finance public schools, our children, your children, come to the public schools with price tag printed on their forehead. Uh, the children of black and Latino kids, by and large, are, are treated as cheap children. They're the Kmart babies of America. You want to see the Lord and Taylor babies, the Neiman Marcus babies, you got to go out to the affluent white suburbs. This is unacceptable. This is not just a, a, a clumsy way of financing education. This is worse. This is a moral and theological abomination. And I hope you folks, as you grow up, will go out into the public arena and fight to change it. <laughs> My belief. The, re the, result, the results are seen in these squalid and chaotic buildings. I visit them, and I'm always amazed at how little has changed. In fact, they've gotten worse than they were when I started out. Uh, it, I, I mentioned the, the cafeterias before. I think that's an important detail. See, I don't think that's, I don't think that's minor. I think aesthetics are important to children. And I... You know, you know, and I visit rich schools, too. And you can't fool me, because I, I grew up in privilege. So I know what it's like. Pineapple once said to me, Dill Pineapple once looked at me, and she said, Jonathan, what's it like over there? Isn't that an interesting question? What's it like over there? At first, I, I, I was embarrassed, and I tried to fudge her question. And I said, you mean where I live in Massachusetts? And she said, no, that's not what I meant. I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, Jonathan, over there. Is that something? A little child of color to ask me. And I said, no, I still don't know what you mean. And, she, and then she, yeah, she wouldn't say where white people live because she was too polite to want to offend me. But she said, you know where you and other people like you can live. And it's like there's a wall, and she's right, there is a wall. And I've, I've been over there on both sides. I go back and forth. I'm more at home in Pineapple's world, to be honest, than in the world of creme brulee. Um, and I'd much rather have a good Puerto Rican meal in, with parents and uh, grandparents in Pineapple's neighborhood than, than um, uh, go to those boring dinners that I which people always have. I don't know why I go to them, but you, I have this problem, though. As I said before, all these people like me. And people I don't like, like me. Um, but I know what it's like over there, because I've been over there. And let me tell you, in beautiful suburban schools, in wealthy neighborhoods, the, lo the lunch rooms are lovely, pleasant places, actually, where you enjoy having lunch. And they have nice, well-organized, attractive, maple-paneled, oak-paneled um, walls and little hexagonal tables where you can sit and chat with two or three of your friends and lovely terraces that outdoor, you can sit outdoors in nice weather and have lunch. And then I come into these basement cafeterias in these horrible schools like Fremont High School in Los Angeles. Nightmare school, 5,000 kids. And it's smelly down there and everybody feels frantic and the kids get herded along for squalid feedings as if they were animals. And let me tell you, aesthetics does matter. Beauty and gentility of surroundings refine the spirits of young people. And ugliness and dirtiness coarsens the spirits of young people. This is one of the ways that class distinctions are created in America. And, uh, and Fremont High, honest to God, is just a nightmare. Uh, half the kids don't even have classrooms. They have to have their classes in trailers. Now... For some reason, in California, they don't call them trailers. They call them bungalows. <laughs> bungalows. But they don't look like bungalows. 
Bungalows are cute. <laughs> Bungalows are well, you know, like nice little people like Jack and Jill, or Hansel and Gretel might live. Pooh and Piglet, maybe, you know, but these, these are smelly trailers, and they, they call them bungalows. Half the kids there are in bungalows. And I walked into one class there where there were 40 kids in the room. Teacher, uh, there's a 10th grade political science class. Are you here tonight, with a, today with us, sir? Oh, because the teacher whose class I visited showed up in the audience yesterday in L.A., and drove me out here to Pasadena. A wonderful teacher, uh, terrific teacher, young teacher, she's only about 25, but boy, she did a great job. <coughs> 40 kids, and she had six classes every day, almost the same size, including homeroom. I said to her, how the hell do you teach 40 kids? I'd just been in a suburb of Boston, a ritzy suburb of Boston, where it's 16 in a class. At Andover, by the way, it's 12 in a class, where Mr. Bush received his excellent education. And uh, <coughs> I say the English faculty must have been on leave while he was there. But, um, but um, you know, uh, 40, these are not a white kid in this class, 40 kids. And I said to Sarah, to the teacher, how the hell do you teach 40 kids? And she said, here, find out. And she gave me her class. I taught them for two hours. They stayed an extra hour because they wanted to question me. Uh, most beautiful kids, uh, very moving and eloquent kids. Their written skills were awful because they'd been, you know, they'd been demolished. Their skills had been demolished in their segregated and unequal schools. Those who could read, read like phonetic drones, but they couldn't comprehend. They had no comprehension skills. Um, they, they'd simply, you know, learn the, the drill. They'd, they'd learn from uh, drill-based, standard-aligned phonics books. But and I'm not opposed to phonics at all. I think phonics is important, but it ought to be part of a broad, a broad literacy program that also includes wonderful books, really good books, not the little snippets of boring stuff that you'll find in books like Open Court but real literature. And, um, and anyway, despite the fact their skills were battered, these kids were beautiful, eloquent. One of them, Mariah, um, a 10th grader who obviously was smart enough to go to college, uh, told me that she'd been forced to take a sewing course the year before. I said, really? And, and she said, now this year they say I have to take hairdressing. And, uh, yeah, I'd heard of that in Mississippi, like, long years ago. They used to make black girls take those courses so they would be suitable housekeepers for white people or good hotel maids or something like that. But I was surprised. This is Los Angeles. And um, I said, no kidding. You're, they're really making you take hairdressing? And another girl in the class raised her hand, a black student raised her hand, I liked her too, and she, she was very feisty. And she said, because she could say I didn't quite believe this. And she said, Hey, Mr., we see in more than y'all can see. Is that interesting? We see in more than y'all can see. By y'all, she meant me, people like me. And I wasn't insulted because she was so truthful. She said, I took two hairdressing courses for credit. I said, No, that can't be. She said, yes, one was hairdressing, and one was advanced hairdressing. It's like AP hairdressing. And <laughs> at, that, at that point, Mariah started to cry in front of the whole class. She said, and I want to tell you, I don't have any disrespect for any career on earth, you know? I don't want you to think I'm disparaging any career. All work is honorable. But there's something rotten in a society that does this to minority kids, and they would never dream of doing it to the children of, of white and affluent people. And uh, Mariah starts to cry, and she says, I didn't want to take sewing. Um, and she said, uh, and I don't want to take hairdressing. And then she says, you know, I already knew how to sew because my mother is a seamstress in a garment factory. She said, 
I didn't need sewing. I don't think you need to sew to get into college. I said, what did, what did you want to take? She said, I wanted to take an AP course in English. At that point, a guy in the class named Fortino, a tough guy, he would have scared you if you met him in the street, but boy, he was brilliant. His eyes were just loaded with a cynical intelligence. Looks right at her. And he says, listen, Mariah, the owners of the factories need workers, right? And she says, I guess they do. And Portino says, they're not going to hire their own kids for those jobs, are they? And one of the girls says, why not? And Mariah says, so their kids can grow beyond themselves, but we remain the same. That's what your state is doing to, the, to, to poor children, children of minorities. You shouldn't accept it. And I want to tell you, those of you who have had more privileged education, I know some of you have, um, sometimes wealthy kids come up to me, middle class white kids come up to me at the end of a talk, and they said, that really moved me, Jonathan. I've had students like from Harvard Law School come up to me and say, that really moved me. And then in a very casual voice, they'll say, maybe I ought to get involved to change it. You know what I say to them? I say, listen, you don't have that choice. You are involved already because you are the recipient of stolen goods. You are the winner in a game that was rigged to your advantage from the start. And that's the truth. That's the truth. I'm going to make... One last comment about high-stakes testing, and I say this with all respect for your superintendent of schools who has to do this stuff because this is the law of the land now, and I, I, um, you know, I empathize with, this, with the dilemma that good educators face in this, in this era of our history where, where the only things that are valued by the state and federal government are things that can be measured on a, on a bubble test. Um, but um, I didn't want to say that since No Child Left Behind went into effect, do you all know what NCLB is? So, uh, no Child Left Untested. Um, uh, the pr principles, good principles in many of the urban schools I know are in a state of terror. They live in continual anxiety. In New York, the tabloid papers always headline the schools that have the lowest scores. Um, the lovely and compassionate New York Post, for example. Um, uh, did any of you ever see that paper? Oh, it's an evil tabloid paper. They'll do things like um, the Dirty Dozen, the 12 worst schools in our city. How would you like to be the principal at one of those schools? You see, and, um, and they're always the most segregated and most poorly funded and most overcrowded schools with the highest turnover of teachers. But the principal gets blamed. And so the principals, in turn, create a sense of terror for the teachers. And the teachers are told, you have to use these scripted texts. And if you deviate, you're, you're showing lack of loyalty to the school. No mention of loyalty to the children. And um, in some of the schools in New York, the teachers actually have to hold timers in their hands so that when the curriculum what they call the curriculum cops come around to check on them, they, they'll be at the right sentence or the right page at the right time. This means that, you know, forget it. If you come into the classroom with a sense of humor, put it away. If you have a good personality, try to conceal it. If you enjoy, if you're fascinated by children and fascinated by their fascination, forget, forget fascination. If you sometimes cry for something that's sad, forget, forget about sadness. If you suddenly just have an explosive longing to come into school and tell the children something beautiful you saw on Sunday afternoon, forget about beauty. There's no room for any of that. There's nothing in NCLB about beauty. There's nothing about laughter. There's nothing about happiness. There's nothing about the heart. You can't, so what's happening is teachers with the best personalities most interesting teachers I know are, are leaving these schools. They'll, I recruit them, and I meet a bunch of you afterwards when we do the book signing. I'm, uh, you know, if 
that I recruit the most interesting people I meet and I say, I want you to come and teach, help change the world, go into the schools in Pasadena or LA, wherever, that need you most, where the poorest kids are. Uh, and a lot of them do it, but then they, within three years, they call me up and they say, I didn't, I didn't sign, I didn't become a teacher because I wanted to be like, um, you know, like, uh, to, turn ba to turn black babies into examination robots. I wanted to give them the same good education I got, Ri culturally broad, rich education, and they quit, they can't take it. You know where they end up? They end up teaching in the wealthy suburbs where they can still be human and where they can share their personalities with children and fall in love with the, with the, with the charming, beautiful personalities that children bring us. I mean, that's the thing that upsets me the most. Because of the standards now, which I'm not opposed to standards, but there's, some, there's a lunatic quality about it right now, in this state especially, and it's not being helped by Governor, what's his name? Um, um, <clears throat> it's, um, there's something, there's a lunatic element to it, I have to tell you. It's, it's true in, in other states as well, where it's not just, um, I mean, it's not just that we want you to teach certain things that are very important, to kids, and I do think it's important. Long division is important. <laughs> um, you know, knowing consonant blends is important. Do y'all know what consonant blends are? Uh, that's a very big concept if you want to teach little people. Um, I never know what to do with kindergarten kids, to be honest. I'm a terrible kindergarten teacher. They're so little, you know. They're so little, to me they seem like gerbils. <laughs> I always let them crawl on me, you know. I pat them, but I like first, second grade, and um, and I'm not opposed to phonics either. I just want to make that clear in case there are any Republicans here today. But I'm not opposed to phonics. I just don't think we should make a religion out of phonics. That's that's what happens. There are a lot of phonics phonetic lunatics in California. I'm telling you, who think that this alone is the solution to all of life's problems. Uh, honest to God, there's a woman like this in Arizona who every time she sees me, she loves me. There's another one, another nut who likes me. And she, she sends me phonics kits which she develops on her own, color-coded phonics systems. They're so confusing I can never figure them out. I don't know how you could teach it to a child. Every time I'm in Arizona, she follows me around. Actually, she likes me, she sits in the front row, no matter what I talk about. I was there once with, years ago with Cesar Chavez to talk about grapes, grapes and lettuce, long years ago. She comes up to me at the end of my talk, grabs me by the elbow, squeezes it hard, so we were old friends, looks in my eyes and says, phonics. <laughs> I call her the phonetic, fanatic of Phoenix. And I hope she didn't follow me here all the way to Pasadena tonight. Uh, look, I'm going to end this on a personal note. I've been telling you a lot of things which could make it tough for you if you go into teaching, because I, I want the best people to go into teaching, but I also want you to go with a healthy irreverence. I want you to go with the power not just to teach that class and make sure the kids get down their long O's and short A's, remember all those things um, from elementary school, but that they also have a chance to enjoy the hours of their childhood. You know, childhood is not simply a period of, of like boot camp training for utilitarian adulthood. Uh, children do not exist uh, as like embryonic workers for the global market. Uh, I was in one kindergarten in Ohio where it said the mission of our class is to prepare uh, workers for, to sharpen America's competitive edge in the global market place. They always said place, marketplace. And I thought, this is kindergarten for God's sake. Why, do these, why should these kids care about the global marketplace? That, that, that's the last thing on their minds. They, you know, they care about itchy elbows or <clears throat> about the little mouse in the, that the teacher has in a little cage to, on a little treadmill or something. 
That's what they care about. They don't care about the global marketplace. So I tell teachers, denounce this. Don't let corporate vocabulary overtake education. Don't let this phony lexicon of, of, um, mer of mercantile uh, avarice uh, invade the classroom. I've been in schools where the principals are so intimidated by the business world now, they won't even call themselves principals. I'm sure you know it's coming here. I'll say to a principal, are you the principal? Now I know she's the principal. I already know it because she's in the principal's office. <laughs> and she's the one who welcomed me to the school. But I say, are you the principal? She says, no. I like to think that I'm the CEO of this, of this building. I said, well, I don't like to think that you're the CEO of this building. I don't say that to her, but that's what I'm thinking. And she call, uh, sometimes they call themselves the building manager, as though they were running the branch of a Walmart or something, the building manager. But children aren't little objects from Walmart, you know. Children aren't, aren't widgets or sticks of gum or things. The children are children. I don't like that. Fight that. And then some of them call their teachers classroom managers. Fight that. Don't, you know, do the, pre prepare them for the test if you have to in order to survive, but don't ever tell them that those tests measure their value on this earth. And, you know, denounce, denounce that madness. If you have to write the standards on the board, sometimes they tell you to put the number next to it. Have any of you seen that? The darn number, you have to write, you can't just write, you know, students will learn about homonyms. I always forget which, what, what homonyms are, but I used to teach that. Something like antonyms, but different, right? <laughs> they sound the same. I guess that's what it is, homonyms. Anyway, uh, they, you can't just write, we're going to learn about homonyms, kids, today. No, no, you have to, you have to say something like, uh, English language standard 267B. Uh, children will demonstrate proficiency in of uh, homonyms. It's, it's got to be, and that number, have you ever seen that number on the wall? Have any, have any of you been in elementary school recently? Uh, they're everywhere in America now. And there's absolutely no reason to put that number up. <coughs> teachers have to go through the, <coughs> teachers have to go through the standards booklets for the state, find the number for everything they teach. There's no, the only reason it's up there is in case somebody from the state comes around to see if if you are being abject and servile enough to put up their number on the blackboard, it has no value to the child. No child is ever going to come back to you in 30 years and say, you know, Miss O'Brien, I am so grateful to you for teaching me standard 267B when I was in third grade. It changed my life to know that number. You know, so this is pure wasted time. And what I say to you in cases like this, be polite, don't make things tough for your principal, and you know, respect the pressure that she's under, but if you're faced with absurdities like these, which, which denounce you, which defy your own intelligence and common sense, and are an insult to your students, here's the answer, just say no. Don't do it. Just say no. And um, I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end now. I'm going to end by saying something personal, and then I want to meet as many of you as possible. Um, it's a, this is a tough time for me to be traveling around the country. This is like day 20 on an 80-day book tour. And uh, it's really hard, and it's lonely. You, make, you meet wonderful people, and then you, you worry you'll never see them again. And uh, you, you're alone a lot of the time. And, uh, I always, late at night, I'm pacing the corridors of hotels. I, I feel like talking to the ice machine sometimes. Um, but it's particularly hard right now because I have parents who are elderly and very frail. Um, my, my father is 99 years old. He was a, lives in Boston with my mom. <clears throat> he was a great neurologist. He was a great diagnostician of brain deterioration. Now he's, now he has been stricken with Alzheimer's. Uh, my mother's 101. God willing, she'll be 102 in December. She, my mother's very sharp and clear. She is a fanatic baseball fan. She, I should love, forgive me, I know we're in LA, um, there's going to be a sensitive issue, 
the next few days. But my mother is a fanatic Red Sox fan. She absolutely hates the New York Yankees, which I think is a healthy reaction for all, for all upright Americans. You know. but, um, uh, she, uh, she loves the Red Sox, and uh, you know, sometimes I look in her eyes and I think, my God, my mom's lived for a whole century. You know, she was a little girl before anyone had heard of Woodrow Wilson. She was a little girl before the first rumblings that led to World War I. She, my mother was 14 years old in the eighth grade, the last time the Red Sox won the World Series. <laughs> she did twice. And, um, you know, she's my best friend in the world. A rock of strength for my entire life, to be honest. I can't bear the thought of losing her. I pray just like a five-year-old kid that my mom can live forever. But, of course, I know she can't. None of us can. We all know we're going to die and lose the ones we love the most to death. The old trees and the infinite playfulness of children will outlive us all. My friends, life goes so fast. Use it well. God bless you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get you set up for a book signing, and I'll let them know if they want to stick around for a dialogue. We'll do that after. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to meet all of you.